I'm Karen Williams. I'm the director of the Stanislaus Literacy Center and the Stanislaus County Library Literacy Program. I'm going to be talking today about making connections in the community. And just in what I do for my job, you can see that a connection, a very important connection has already been made. Stanislaus Literacy Center is a nonprofit organization that's been in Stanislaus County since 1987. Stanislaus County Library Literacy Program has been around since 1996. And we partnered together to create the Reading Works Adult Literacy Program that serves the entire county. And it has been a very important and meaningful collaboration. But I'm going to talk to you about several kinds of collaborations today. Here's our agenda for the day. We've already done the introduction. But why do we need partnerships? Uh, why are these important to us in doing our job in literacy? How do we make them? How do we strengthen them? And then basic principles for connections. Making a plan, because if you don't leave here with some kind of plan, you probably won't use what you're going to learn today in any meaningful way. So we're going to talk about how do you make a plan. I'm going to share with you some success stories from my experiences in collaboration. And then I'm going to talk to you about how do you use those partnerships to find funding. Funding is so essential to what we do, and partnerships can really add to that. And then we're going to, I hope you'll go back and reflect and share with other people in your organization the kinds of things that you learned today. Why are connections important? Well, these are the three big reasons I came up with. And I think they're all things that we're all striving to do. A connection will help you improve the services you offer. Maybe it will give you more students for your program if that's what your struggle is. Maybe it will give you more volunteer tutors. Maybe it will give you money. Maybe it will give you a place to provide your services that's better for your students and tutors. Maybe it will give you a new outlet you hadn't even thought of before. It will build an image in the community. People will get to know who you are and what you do. And that's so important because if somebody is wanting to give money to literacy or somebody is wanting to uh, send somebody to your program to get help or volunteer in your program, if they don't know about you, of course they're not ever going to find you. And so you need to have that image so that people know where to look and know what you're doing. And then you need to increase your opportunities for funding, which also increases your opportunities for programs, for being able to provide services throughout your county. And all of these things come from having good connections. So how do you establish those? Well, there's that dirty word that none of us likes to hear, meetings. And meetings, and more meetings. That is the only way I know of to really get started in getting yourself out there, meeting people, and making connections that you need to make. If you are sitting behind your desk and you're just answering the phone calls that come in or you're just responding to your tutors and students and waiting for them to come find you, you're not going to grow like you need to grow. You're not going to impact your area of service the way that you need to. You're not going to make a difference because people aren't going to come and find you. You have to go find them. So meetings is a wonderful way for that to happen. Uh, collaboratives have been set up in many, in many venues. One of them that I know about is the 21st Century Grants. This is a, a federal grant that provides family literacy money um, as part of the 21st Century Grant. It it's, was created as an after-school initiative. But in that initiative, they actually have a separate funding for family literacy. So uh, that's where we got involved. But they have to set up a collaborative as part of this grant. That is a a mandate that they have. And so you're going to be able to find collaboratives anywhere you find 21st century grants. And you need to look to your school districts, to your county office of education to find those. And then you need to get involved because there's a lot of players sitting around that table of people that are providing services within the school district, providing things that have to do with education. So find those collaboratives. There's other collaboratives out there as well. Um, some Prop 10 collaboratives have been set up and every community is different so I don't know what your collaborative is but you should know and if you don't know you should go find out. 
There are also advisory committees in our county. There's an advisory committee on youth to the mayor. It's actually on after school for youth. And so I got involved with that, and there I was sitting at the table with the chief of police, the, the chief of the fire department, um, the head of neighborhood programs, a lot of government heads, a lot of um, even business heads sat at that table on that committee. And I got to know them, and that was an important thing. Also, if you have a literacy coalition or network in your community, uh, that's a good place to go. If you don't have one, you probably need to start one. There was one already existing in, the, in our county, so I didn't have to go create it. But I sit on a subcommittee that heads up that literacy coalition. And at times, we have had around the table lots of business leaders, uh, lots of government agency leaders that have led to many of the f uh, programs that we now offer. There are also networks in related fields. We happen to have a mentoring network in our county. And mentoring is part of what our tutors do when they meet with their students. And so um, that just happened to relate well enough to what we do for me to be involved in that network. But you're going to find other networks that will meet your needs and will um, be available in your county. United Way is another place you should go. I, you should go there for funding, and we'll talk about that later. But even if you didn't have United Way funding, if you get involved in their committees um, that give out the funding, there's in our county they call it an impact council. It could be called lots of things in different places. But if you get involved in those committees that give out the money, you, you start to see how they choose places that they give money to, uh, and then you can be better informed about giving out money and you can also make a lot of good contacts with other nonprofit agencies, government agencies and business leaders. Um, there's lots of local boards. You could sit on them. Um, just by sitting on a local board you get to know people. You get to know people that um, are really known in the community a lot of times and have connections that you need. I heard of one program, I didn't do this, but another program um, had a business breakfast and invited business leaders to come, have breakfast. They provided the breakfast and then they got to talk to them about literacy needs in their area of service. And then you've got to think about what's going on in your uh, city, your county, wherever it is that you have your literacy program. And then you come up with your ideas of how can I get more involved with this community? What's going on? Where are the people? And it won't stay the same. Right now, there are collaboratives for 21st century grants, but they weren't there when I came um, to our program almost 10 years ago. But they're there now. And in another 10 years, who knows what it'll be. So you can't just rest on your laurels. You've got to be looking at what's going on in your community and what are the opportunities for making connections. And it's going to mean going to meetings. This was a piece of wisdom that my husband gave me when I first started being a, a, running a, the literacy program was, you know, I'm a very task-oriented person and I go to work and I have my list of things to do and, and I want to get through that list by the end of the day and I'd go home and I'd say, man, I didn't get anything done because all these people kept calling and stopping by my office and, and he reminded me, honey, your job is your interruptions. And I think it's important to have that attitude, to have that attitude that you are going to um, respond as something is presented to you. Somebody calls you on the phone and asks if you would get involved with something, then you're going to need to respond to that and, and let it interrupt you and not think about how it's going to throw off your schedule, but respond so that you get involved with what you need to be involved in. Uh, you need to develop those relationships that you're making. Okay, you're going to the meetings, you're starting to get to know people. Well, that's not going to be enough because sometimes those meetings only last an hour, an hour and a half, and you really don't get to talk much at those meetings. So this is where you have to follow up on that. You meet them at the meeting, but then you follow up with a lunch or a breakfast. I probably eat lunch or breakfast with someone about once a week, sometimes twice a week because that's where you really sit down and you start talking through um, how you can better partner, what can they do for you, what can you do for them, kinds of things can go on over a meal. And very few people will turn down that opportunity. Um, you need to look for a champion for your cause. 
Uh, I was very fortunate as a brand new person in literacy when I came to the Literacy Center. The president of my board was very well connected out in the community. Her husband was a city council member. She knew lots of people. They'd been there a long time. And whenever I needed something, I went to her and she knew who to talk to. And sometimes I would talk to them, sometimes she would talk to them. But she knew who to go to and she knew how to make it happen. And if you don't have that person who is a champion for you, you need to find that person. You need to think who do you know or who does someone you know know who could be that champion for you. We have this lovely lady in our community named Betty Bell Smith. And she's a little bitty old lady, about 80 years old, and as sweet as pie. And she raises more money for any cause, any nonprofit cause that she feels is important. If she is on your side, if her name is mentioned, you will get lots of donations because of her. And we're trying to get her to be involved with an event we have coming up simply because we know that if she's involved and she asks people to give money to it, they will because of who she is, because of her reputation in the community. So you find those people who already have a reputation and you get them on your side and then you use what they can do to help you. And if they begin, begin to believe in your cause, then they're going to be a great champion. Another thing I discovered was that if I give of what I have to other people and scratch their back, then they will help me. And I have had um, a man who runs the ROP program at our school district, our Modesto City Schools. He's been wonderful about helping me, bending over backwards to to give me something that I need that he can help me with. And then he's come to me a couple of times and asked for my help, and I have been quick to give it because he always gives to me any time that he can. And so I, I learned from him that if I am doing that, then people won't mind giving to me when I ask. Also, sometimes there's that person that you don't really have a way to get to know them. You don't have a way for them to get to know you that you can think of but they would be a great partner. You know, they're, they're somebody who's very connected in the community or they're somebody that has a lot of potential in getting you funding or, or um, influence in the community. And you want to get to them, but you don't know how. Well, this is a great one. Invite them to an event as a speaker because at that event, guess what? They're going to hear from your students. They're going to hear from you. They're going to know what it is that you do and how you do it. We had a perfect example of this. I wasn't the one who invited this person. I didn't even know this person, but it worked in my benefit. We, we, our Literacy Coalition puts on a lunch once a year that's for um, movers and shakers in the community, basically, is who's invited to come, or people in the education committee. They come, and we do award ceremony for um, the best literacy person, the best GED, and the best English learning English. And we give an award to three people, and they speak. And we have this speaker that um, we have at the event. Well, our speaker at the last minute couldn't come. So we had to find one. And we found this guy who has um, eight Del Tacos in our county. He owns them and runs th those businesses. And he has a wonderful story about how he rose from you know, not speaking English hardly at all to being a business owner and running all these businesses. So he spoke at our event. very very good speaker and and afterwards he came to me gave me his business card and said I want to talk to you I need your business card because I want to talk to you about helping my employees because he heard at that event about our program and what we do and saw how we might be able to help him which we're gl glad to do and then someday I hope he'll turn around and maybe help us as we whether it's providing food or providing funding for us and so that's one way that you get yourself known to someone I've also been diligent in collecting and distributing business cards. I'm not as good as some people. Um, I know some people that you can't go anywhere without them handing out their cards everywhere they, they go and picking up cards everywhere they go. And uh, there are those people, and I try to do it as, as much as I can because I have used so many of those business cards that I have picked up. I have a little notebook, and I stick them in there, and I try to write a little note to myself about what this person, you know, how I met them or something, something important about them that'll help me remember who they are. And I stick them away. And so many times I refer to that when I need something, I'm able to look them up and give them a call. 
And once you make a connection with someone, it's good to follow it up. Handwritten notes are wonderful these days. In the days of emails, people don't write notes anymore. So when you write a note to someone, they take notice more than ever before. So that's a good follow-up. If you've had this good connection with someone, maybe you had lunch with them, maybe um, they spoke at your event, you need to write them a little handwritten note and make it very personal. Um, if they told you about how much they enjoy fishing, go out and get a card with a fisherman on the front that shows you were paying attention and you know what they like, and then write them a note. That will mean so much to them, and, and it's something that you can maybe follow up with with an email or a phone call at another time. And that's the last one. Send emails to follow up on calls. Send co make calls to follow up on emails. You just need to use different ways of uh, making connections with people and following up. Don't just have one short conversation with somebody and let that be the end of it, because that will be the end of it. You will need to follow up. You will need to make the effort to get to know them better. And that leads us to some principles, um, because one connection often leads you to another one. You will make a connection with somebody that you think, you know, I think this person can probably help me. And as you get to know them, you realize they can't, but they know someone who can. And that person is then able to help you. So always be looking for who does somebody else know that can help you if they can't help you, uh, at least in that particular way. And the more communication you have, the stronger the connection. It's like a it's sort of like an interstate highway versus a little dirt track through the forest. The, the stronger it is and the wider and the, and the more paved it is, the easier to communicate. So you need to keep digging away at that dirt until you have this nice, smooth highway of communication with that person. Keep making connections with them. And always know if you're going to meet with someone to ask them for their help or to get them involved in your program, always know going in what it is that you want from them specifically. If, especially if you're making some kind of really formal pitch, make sure that you have figured out exactly what it is you need and maybe have more than one level of help. We just went to a company and asked them to help us with one of our events to provide the, the hors d'oeuvres at the event. So, I found out that to provide all the hors d'oeuvres, the, the mega package that I really wanted was $8,000, and I wasn't sure they'd go for that. So I had a second one, which was about half that, where all they do is provide the cheese. And I said, you know, either one of these, we'd be glad if you would do it. Just, you know, tell us what you're willing to do. Well, they did the high-end one, which is great. But I was prepared for them to do the other one, and that would have been great too. So sometimes you need to have different levels that people can help you. And another principle, I think, is that co-location can be extremely valuable. We have been involved in a couple of different one-stops, and, and there's a lot of uh, different models of one-stops out there. Some people call a one-stop if all they do is they have good ways of referring people back and forth to programs. That can be called a one-stop, but they're not co-located together. Um, we were fortunate enough to be put for a while in a co-location with a lot of c county agencies, other programs that really have been valuable even today when we're no longer co-located because of funding issues, um, is still valuable because we made some great connections that continue on today. Now we know that we are going to have to find new ways of keeping those connections alive because unfortunately things continue to change. People retire, people move on to other jobs, so the people who knew about us might not be there anymore. So we do have to keep making those connections and we're trying to work on better ways to do that. But when we were co-located, it was wonderful. And so I just, I just urge you to, if you can be co-located, um, somehow, even with just one office, one person part-time or something like that in a one-stop kind of physical location, do it because it will bring you more uh, outreach into your community and it will bring you connections that will lead to funding and to other uh, things that are valuable for your program. And I always urge people to use a board or if you can't have a, a board of directors to have an advisory board or committee because that will multiply your connections. You can't do it alone and you shouldn't do it alone. You, you, won't, you won't have enough 
influence in your community as one person. But when you have 12 people on, on a board who are all out there in the community making connections for you, then you have so much more influence than you do by yourself. So if you don't have an advisory committee or board or um, some kind of way to have other people helping you, get one. Um, don't, don't even hesitate. Do it tomorrow. Start calling people and saying, I want to set up an advisory committee and I need you to sit on it. Um, people will tell you no, but enough people will tell you yes that you will have more help than you've ever had before. So use that board of directors. Ask them to make connections for you. Um, we have a board of directors. We meet monthly and I'll bring a problem to them and somebody on that board will know somebody who can do something about that problem and they say, hey, I'll give so-and-so a call or I'll drop them an email. Um, or sometimes they'll say, you know, I'll let them know that you'll be calling or that you'll be emailing and they open the door for me so that I can get to that person that I need to talk to. And another important thing with a board or a committee is that you communicate to them the information that they need to know about making a literacy case. Um, they need to know what they need to say to people um, about literacy. And the new stuff that just came out in the, in the survey that was done nationally is stuff that you need to know off the top of your head and you need to communicate to them. I recently took a handout that um, was given to me that was very, very uh, succinct about um, the results of that survey and I gave it to all my board of directors and I said you need to read this you need to know what this says so that when people ask you questions about how many people are, are illiterate in our county or how many people don't know how to read well you know the answer and you can make that case um, my the director of the library is excellent because she brings it up she was in the grocery store the other day and brought it up to the cashier she, because they were having such a problem with this one couple in front of her using the ATM machine. And after they left, she said, do you know how many people in this county are illiterate? And they said, no. She said, 25% she said, of the people can't read well. And maybe that's the problem that, that couple was having. I mean, she just said it to this man in the grocery store. So you need to make sure that your people know that information to pass it on. And another thing that's important is to get to know key people at the newspaper um, because the newspaper can be such an advocate for you. We've had wonderful articles in the newspaper and every time we get them we get 50 people at our next tutor training. So I always let them know that and um, they're always really good about trying to get a feature story in at least once a year if not more. Um, so you get to know them, you, you have meetings with them, you make, con I knew somebody who made cookies and took it up to the newsroom to pitch their story. So, you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. Another way is to use letters to the editor. Those are very well read. It would be good to maybe around the survey that just came out, write a very thoughtful letter about the literacy problem in your county, get it published in the paper under the letters to the editor. Um, I've also heard from news people that it's, if you want a feature on your program, if you pitch it right around the holidays when they have lots of ads and not, not a lot of people working so the news is kind of light and um, a lot of people are on vacations, then they can write those ahead of time, they can run them over the holidays. So it's a good time to pitch your story um, is around the holiday. I give out our annual report everywhere I go. I go to service clubs. I have, we have an annual luncheon, sort of an annual meeting. Uh, invite lots of people from the community to come. Give them a free lunch. Talk about our program. Distribute our report. Make sure that they know what we accomplished this last year. Um, anytime people give donations, I send them an annual report. I want them to be able to read what we're doing. And to make, we try to make it simple so it's not too much to read, not too hard to understand. And then we just want them to read it and to know what's going on in our little arena. And that's one way to do it. Um, I go to a lot of service club meetings. Um, I feel like sometimes that I waste my time going to them, but I know I don't. Uh, some good things that have come out of that is I've gotten tutors out of them, not a lot, but a few. In fact, one woman, I think it took her four years from the time I talked to the service club before she became a volunteer. So, you know, you never know. Down the road you'll get them. Um, 
also we've gotten free books for our children's program we've gotten donations um, they've it's been very helpful just to get the word out about who we are and what we're doing and they're always glad to have people come and speak to their service club we also hold events and participate in events we um, go to some of the festivals and set up a booth we have a couple of events a year that we put on and those are all really valuable to build recognition for our cause we're also going to put our foot in the door by starting with a small request that's how um, you get people to help you sometimes the eight thousand dollar request is too much well you know what that I didn't start with that I started with having dinner with the president of that company because my husband knew his wife kind of thing and mentioned we were having an event he said oh we'd like to help send an email to this person and tell us what you need so you can't always just go cold you very rarely can go cold and ask for something of someone unless you've made some kind of connection to them first or you've started out with something small and so sometimes you just get one thing donated for an event and then the next time you get a little bit more donated because you did a good job of following up and thanking them and letting them know how important that was to you and then next time they'll give you more so sometimes you have to really build that or you have to find somebody who knows that person to get um, that donation request and don't be afraid to ask for in-kind because they're going to be more likely to start with an in-kind kind of gift to you than to give you very much in cash so start with the in-kind and then hopefully the other will come also and then if you use your connection to families and children um, that that helps because they they really give more with their hearts than their heads and a lot of times when I'm writing about um, our need for tutors I'll write about how this 40 year old woman has three children and she can't read to them and she needs a tutor well that's a lot more impacting than this 40 year old housewife wants somebody to teach her to read because there's children involved and they want to know that and they might give to that you know you have to know what you want before you can get it and when you want to develop a partnership you have to be strategic about it you have to know what it is you want them to do for you and what you can do for them um, because most people don't want to do something for you unless they're going to get something out of it so you need to have that all clear in your head before you go and ask and you want to make sure that whatever you're asking for whatever you're willing to do is consistent with your objectives you don't want to go off doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with literacy just because you want this person in your corner because then you'll get sidetracked and you won't get what done what you need to get done so make sure it's consistent with what you want to do and be strategic about partnerships um, you can make almost anyone a partner if you're persistent and creative and strategic but you just need to figure out who that person is and then go after them and I'm going to give you an example of something that we did um, that has still not borne a lot of fruit but I'm giving it to you as an example of here's where we're started and here's where we're headed and here's where we are um, we decided that we wanted to be more involved with the workforce education the alliance they call it in our county it's the WIA the Workforce Investment Act um, people and every county or um, I think it's by county has a workforce investment alliance and gets money and whatever they do with it is up to each county to sort of come up with their plan but our pl our county has dealt with it by sort of joining the economic development piece and the workforce investment piece into one big group called the alliance and we wanted to get them on board with us for them to realize that literacy was a key component of their goals what they were trying to do which was have a more educated workforce that that literacy was a key to that was the very foundation of that and so maybe they needed to think about how they could help our program be more successful whether it was money or it was volunteers or it was a space for our program or all of the above that they needed to know that we needed their help and that literacy was important to their cause so I found someone who was able to call together the president of the Alliance and the head of what was then our Department of Employment and Training which isn't called that anymore but it was at that time 
we pulled those people together and we had a meeting with them. Well, we didn't just go into this meeting and say, oh, we just wanted to talk to you about literacy today and sort of ramble. We, we really worked out and had meetings prior to this between myself and this person who got me the meeting. And we sat there, he was the board president at the time, and we sat there and we talked about what it is they're trying to achieve and what it is we're trying to achieve and how those two connect and how do we um, say that to them. What are our talking points going to be? And we worked up a little uh, front and back page of a one page and worked that up and had it to give to them, but also to use as an outline of what we were going to talk about. And so we went in very prepared. Um, also, this man was very astute, and he, he, when we first got in the room, he said to them, what do you know about us already? What is it that you know about literacy in this county, and what is it you know about us? And so we were able to find out where they already were before we went into our pitch, and it was great to have that background. And then we asked for their input and assistance, and we had on that sheet of paper what we wanted them to do for us. And we had everything from helping us get volunteer tutors, to helping us with um, having space for our program that was free or reduced price. And we asked them for funding. We asked them for just a variety of things. And we didn't know what they would be able to give us, but we were asking them to think about helping us in all those ways. Um, they came back with, well, right away we can help you get tutors. All we have to do is take those flyers. We meet with businesses all the time. We'll be glad to do that. And so we've put that into place. The second thing that they ended up doing was putting me on their workforce education committee, which they formed after this meeting, and asked me to be on that committee. And there are some things happening right now in our county moving us toward a more strategic approach to workforce education. And guess what? I'm involved because I had this meeting with them. Um, and then you follow up with emails, which we did. We followed up and we said, you know, here's the things you asked for. Tell me how else I can help. And, and I've emailed them over other issues several times. So I'm on their radar screen because of this meeting. So what I want you to do is develop a partnership plan. And I think right now is a good time while I'm talking, you can be taking out that sheet of paper and starting to write down some ideas. I want you to think about whether or not you need a champion. Is there someone you need um, to help your cause in your county? Um, along with that, I want you to think about what are your goals? What's some one big thing that you would like to accomplish in the next year? And you don't know how to do it. So kind of think about those things at the same time. What is your goal? And who could your champion be that could help you achieve that goal? And then write those things down. And then I want you to think about how do you get to this champion? How do you get to know them? What's it going to take? Is it going to take having an event and asking them to be a speaker? Is it going to take um, someone you know talking to them for you? Is it going to take you just calling them cold and saying, please, would you mind meeting with me? Sometimes that works. Sometimes if they're too busy, that won't work. But you can try. Um, is it going to take? Um, going to a meeting that they are already attending, some board, some committee, some collaborative, and getting to know them over time. So you think about that. You think about how you're going to get this person on your side. And then you're going to think about what it is that you can do for them and what it is you want them to do for you. And what are those things? And write those things down. And then you're going to think about what else do you need? Do you need funding? Do you need space? Do you need uh, books? Do you need materials? And who can give you those things? If this person can't, who else do you need to get what you need to make this work? So you just start strategically planning that one goal. How am I going to make this happen? And what partners do I need? And how am I going to make them my partner? And really work toward that. It might take you a year, and that's OK, but at least be working toward it. Something very important to remember as you're choosing that partner, that champion, is that you are who you have as a partner, and you need to protect their reputation and your own. So you don't want to pick somebody who maybe has a little shady um, past or that people might perceive as having a shady past. Maybe stuff has been about 
in the paper about them. You don't want that kind of person being your champion because not everybody trusts them. So you want to make sure you get a trustworthy partner. At the same time, you want to make sure that, that you protect their reputation once you get them on board whenever you can. You don't put them down. You don't tell somebody else, oh, they don't really do a very good job for us because that could get back to them and then it hurts you and it hurts them. So it's very important that you choose well who your partners are. I'm going to tell you a few of our success stories that have come from collaboration. Um, we got a contract to provide services to welfare to work clients who needed help with literacy. And this came through a short conversation with our county welfare director. In fact, it was part when we were co-located in a one-stop that was for welfare to work clients. Um, they allowed us to have an office for literacy there. And the county welfare director was coming through at the open house and you know, just looking in at everybody's program and I went up and introduced myself and said, you really need to think about um, using our program to help your, your clients or your customers with their literacy needs because most, uh, there's a high percentage of them who have a need for literacy and I went into all the statistics and all of the need and I sort of had it prepared in my head and, and so he said, you know what, send me a one pager and in an email form and gave me his card, which of course I did. And the original thing I asked for, which was actually to do a family literacy program in a school that served a lot of people that were low income and a lot of welfare people, uh, wasn't what he gave me, but what he gave me was a contract for $100,000 to serve their clients who needed help with literacy. And that contract is in effect today. We've had it for about five or six years um, because of that one conversation. We're now working with um, five school districts, five different school districts to provide nine family literacy programs and adult classes in an even start. And this started through um, a person in the school district who was actually working in one of our family programs. Her husband was a principal. They wanted to have a CBEC class and couldn't get it off the ground. She knew that we could do it. She said to her husband, you need to get the literacy center. And we started doing their program. And then other people heard about us, heard what a good job we were doing, heard we were great at putting out a program. And so now we have five different school districts that contract with us. And you know, part of it is you can't just make that connection, get the funding, and then do a lousy program. You have because then you don't get anywhere, but you have to do a good program. You have to really do what they're asking you to do and, and keep, that, um, keep them pleased with the way that you do your work so that they'll keep that connection going. And um, we also are working with family resource centers. Our particular county chose to take their Prop 10 money, which is the tobacco tax, and to use that to develop family resource centers. And we have them all over our county and we work with two of them right now and provide adult literacy and then they then pay us the money that we need for our staff to do those programs for their family resource centers. And those just came through getting to know people. One came through knowing somebody through United Way and the other came from sitting on a Turlock Collaborative which is a collaborative for one of the cities in our county. They have one for the city and I sat on that with some people that um, decided that what they needed was some kind of resource center for families and went after the Prop 10 funding and I was on that subcommittee and so when it came around to who was going to provide services in that family resource center, of course we were right there saying we want to do literacy and got funding to do that. So those are just three ways that by going to meetings, by getting to know people, we, we got contracts for services and funding to do services and new and unique ways to provide literacy throughout our county. I think you need to know that nonprofits are good partners. Now I know a lot of people watching this um, probably are a literacy program within their library. And so what you need to do is find a way to work with a nonprofit. Um, maybe it's your friends of the library, maybe it's your library foundation. Um, because to really be able to move quickly and do what you need to do, a lot of times a nonprofit can do it much faster and easier than a government agency that has uh, hiring freezes and, and things going on in the um, 
upper echelons that keep us from being able to do the job we need to do. So if you can find a way to work with a nonprofit to provide services, it may bode well for you being able to do some of these things. Workplace literacy is, is a thing that's, I think, becoming more and more. It's kind of coming back around. It was here before. It sort of waned for a while. At least in our county, it waned for a while because businesses were just not able to provide the funding to do it. And now it's coming back. I think businesses are seeing that it's becoming almost a critical mass issue that there's not an a, a educated enough workforce to meet their needs, and they're looking at ways to change that. So what I have did from day one when I came in and we had a workplace literacy program where we were providing services, we were providing tutors, and they were giving us no money, I put a stop to that because I said, you are benefiting from this financially. You need to help us out so that we can at least recoup our costs in doing this program. And so you have to do your homework. You have to know how to show them that this program is going to help their bottom line. You need to make it cost effective for them or they're not going to go for it because they are businessmen. But there is a way to do a workplace literacy program and then have them pay for it. Because of this, your services of your agency are valuable and worth paying for, so ask for money. When you're providing a service directly tailored to a business or a government agency and you're meeting the needs of their clients, ask them to pay the costs of doing that program because a lot, almost always they will say yes if that is important to them to have that program. So just like the kid on the street corner doesn't give away the lemonade, you don't need to give away your lemonade. And you need to diversify your funding. It is not good to be um, solely funded by only one or two sources. I know that the State Library has, has encouraged people to go out and get other funding sources by setting it up so that they give a percentage of their funding based on a percentage of what you get from your local community or the state to provide um, literacy programs. So you need to make sure you're fully diversified. And these are some sources. Uh, we get federal funding through the um, WIA Act. Um, we also get state and local funding uh, through, a well, we also get CDBG, which is federal, 21st century is federal. And then um, we get fees and contracts, which probably is the area where we have grown the most in the last few years, is a lot of government agencies contract us for services. We charge fees, we never charge the man who walks in the door and asks for our help. Never. Anyone who walks in the door and wants help with literacy always gets their services for free. So it's never that person that pays a fee. It is only a business or someone who has money and wants you to tailor your program to meet their need or wants you to come in and provide for their clients. Those kinds of people we charge fees to. And they will pay those fees and then you're able to provide the service to more people. And also donations. It's really great to go out and get donations because that's the most flexible money you have and that's where you have the most potential for increasing your funding source is by getting more donations. And those collaborations, connections you make in the community also lead to donations. And I always look for ways to combine funding because so many times it's hard to take one funding source and use that for one program and then that funding source goes away and the program just has to go away because it only had one source to begin with. Well, don't do that to yourself. Look for ways that you can take funding and braid it to provide one program. Because sometimes, for instance, in a family literacy program, you might have a funding that centers on zero to five. Well, that'll take care of your preschool kids that come with mom and dad to the program. And then you have an adult literacy funding source or an ESL funding source or something that provides for the parents to have education. So you have that funding in place. And then you have after school funding that provides for that K through six or whatever age group you're, you're serving with your program. So you look for, who, for how you can take those different funding sources and, and uh, fund this one program with a variety of sources. But the thing that you have to do whenever you do that is make sure, number one, that your funding source allows you to do that, allows you to braid your funding that way, and that you're not doing something that you're not supposed to be doing with your money. So that's always number one, and I always make sure that I'm doing something that's okay with the funding source. And then you have to have good record keeping. Um, sometimes 
we have to we have time cards that people break down their hours by four or five six funding sources throughout a day because they work for a lot of different programs we have something like 25 different funding sources and we have to break down their time cards and the hours that they spend based on that funding source sometimes you have to have good data management of your students because um, you're reporting to so many different sources and you have to make sure what you're reporting is good data um, for that program and financial software will help you track the funding sources from all these different places and how it's being spent so that you can allocate the cost appropriately so you have to have all of that in place if you're gonna have multiple funding sources you're gonna braid your funding sources you have to make sure you have all that in place so that you do it right <clears throat> one of the things I realized early on was that I needed a middle layer of management as we grew and if you do these collaborations you are gonna grow then you're going to get to the point where you can't do it all. We had a family literacy program, we had a literacy program, we had a jail program, and I was trying to manage all of those uh, directly, sort of hands-on. Had people under me, but I was the hands-on management, and I couldn't do it. It was spreading me too thin, nothing was getting done right. And if you get to that point, that's when you need to find a way through, hopefully, more funding sources to have that middle layer of somebody directly responsible for, for the program so that you are only ultimately responsible that they're doing their job. And um, then you'll be able to keep up. Because I hear out in the field a lot of people saying, well, I can't do all this. I'm just one person. Well, maybe you need to get the funding so that you can have other people under you who do it. And you need to make sure that when you're, when you're providing outcomes, a lot of places let you choose your outcomes. Um, not everywhere but a lot of places do so if you're going to get to choose them choose the ones that are the same for other places that you're mandated to do for instance we use CASAS testing because we are already doing things for the State Department of Education which demands CASAS testing well CASAS testing comes in handy when we're reporting to the United Way we're reporting to CDBG we're reporting to the library we have some results to show in testing gains um, we also use whether they have completed a level or whether we have surveys. We try to make the, everything we do standardized to all our programs so that we're not like, okay, this program we need this and this program we need this, that it's all the same for all of our programs. And that'll make your life a lot easier. So to summarize what we've talked about today, uh, partnerships and funding are two key elements to a healthy and growing organization. And I firmly believe that if you have those good partnerships, if you have those good relationships, and collaborations out in the community, it will lead you to more funding. And I know funding is the, one of those big issues that everybody struggles to find. They need funding to do so much of what they want to do. So go out, form those partnerships, look for them, be strategic about them, and make that happen so that you can get the funding that you need to provide the adult literacy program that you want to provide. <clears throat>